to begin with, Don, if you don't mind. Uh, I, I did. I carried a camera all the way through World War II with me. This one right here. You can't even buy film for it anymore. What kind is that? It's a Kodak, a 127, roll film, but I tried to buy some up uh, up at the right drug one day and just to, to have it. And Needy says, you know, it's just that. She says, they don't even make that film anymore. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I ha there's my last four serial numbers of my uh, 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 serial number, you know, my army serial number. Uh, but I had it in a, uh, I had a pouch with the hooks on it to hook into my cartridge belt. I carried it all the way through the war with me, and nobody questioned it. It was your own camera, or did uh, they issue my, it to It's my you? personal camera. Mm -hmm. And, uh, in fact, right here, if you'll notice this picture right here, up here? No, right at the bottom of it. Oh, there's your See camera. that little camera yeah. there? Yeah. Okay, that is a picture that I mailed home to some friends in Eldora that had a jewelry store down there that I knew years ago when I worked down there, telling them uh, to buy the camera and to please send it to me. Okay. So when it came, I just stuck it in my duffel bag and took it along. And I carried it on my cartridge belt all the way. Consequently, I have a quite a packet of... Where did they go? That's weird. Oh, you don't, you won't want to look at these now. In fact, you may take them home with it. You want to look at these are all pictures that I took over in Germany and elsewhere. There's notations on the back of them, and if you'll notice, they've all been approved by the censor, by the by the officer of the outfit, mm -hmm. uh, so that I could keep them. And being in the Signal Corps, I don't know just how I got it done, but in being in the Signal Corps, I knew some fellows that uh, uh, could develop them for me. And even your photos were censored by uh, the They're Army? All, uh, the, your, your Army stamp was on the back of them, where they were, where they were approved. And you said I could borrow these for a couple of days? So. Approved for, uh, for personal use. Now, here's another little jewel that I will loan you, but for heaven's sake, don't lose it because it's irreplaceable. Uh, this book here. 12th Corps. Okay. The 12th Corps was General Patton's first love. Mm -hmm. It was the, the heart of the Third Army. Okay. Okay. Uh, this book is full of all the, uh, even starting with the front page here, is full of all the details of where the 12th Corps went, what they did, the units, the divisions that were with it. Here is the battle route of the 12th Corps hmm. with all the battle in red. stations. Uh, in red? In the red, yes. Mm -hmm. And if, if you notice, it starts clear up here at uh, Greenwich, Scotland. Mm -hmm. It winds up clear down at Linz, Austria. Wow. So we zigzagged all the way through Germany and France. and That's the same map as this, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, there's, there's all kinds of maps in there showing battle stations and, and uh, detailed reports of uh, well, the Bailey Bridge, yeah, I talked to someone else who was involved in building those. Yeah. So, like I said, you'll find a world of information. Yeah, in this that is book. quite the book. And the book, I don't know, here, I can take that too. Uh, they came around one day and said they were going to write this book, the Signal Corps was, and did I want to sign up for one? Mm -hmm. Well, it was sometime after the war that I got that book, and I doubt if a person could ever, ever, ever get another one. It'd be pretty hard to find one, I'm sure. Yeah, it'd be almost impossible. But like I said, the complete history of... Uh, now, the 93rd Signal Battalion is what I was... the unit I was with. The 93rd Signal Battalion furnished the communications for the entire 12th Corps. I'm talking about everything from the front, from the rear echelon to the front echelon, to all the divisions, all the infantry, all the uh, uh, armored divisions, etc. Each one had its own little signal corps, but we furnished all the communications to that. Okay. If there was a crossing of the Rhine, a crossing of the Starport River, or the Rome or, or Rhone River, or any of those, we were across the river 
with telephone lines before the before our units even crossed. We went over in darkness in boats. Wow. And were never detected. Huh. And were you armed, I assume? Uh, uh, for, for the most part not. I, no, I had a, I, I went all the way through the war and never fired a shot. Did you carry a weapon though? I was too busy. I had a carbine. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was too busy and we were told when we went into Signal Corps that we were we were shooting ducks. Uh, Lord knows I got shot at plenty of times. I got strafed continually by aircraft, by fighter planes, and uh, under our artillery fire continually. And uh, we had to watch out for paratroopers dropping in behind us and such things like that. But I was not involved in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Mm -hmm. But so many, much of the time, we were ahead of our units. If they were going to advance, we would, four of us, would go ahead in the dark of night and we'd cross the river or go clear over into the enemy territory and lay lines, either in trees or on the ground or whatever, and uh, have the lines over there so they could hook onto them because in those days radio communications were not what they are today. So these and were like field telephone lines? Beg pardon? Field telephone we, lines? We had what they called field wire, which was a, a twisted wire. It, it uh, looked like some, something like the old uh, twisted uh, wire that used to hang from a ceiling with a light bulb on it, you know. Oh, yeah. It was twisted yeah. like that. Okay, it had about four strands, four fine strands of copper wire in it and one steel strand. And it was almost impossible to break it. Okay. And uh, we used to roll that off of drums on the back of jeeps or we had some about two and a half ton trucks with uh, motorized drums that would throw it out into the fields so that the tanks came along later they wouldn't tear it up on the road oh, okay. or we would string it through the trees just any way to get it there we'd put up poles we uh, any old way to, to get the wire there but we always had them we always had it uh, had it ahead of the combat area uh, we also used a cable which had four pairs of wires in it which was uh, I don't know what the cover was it was either rubber or neoprene but we would bury that we would we would uh, we would go across the river and we'd wait it to the bottom of the river so that was on there the other side and we used we used teletype and uh, we used wire photo now that was something unheard of in those days we had a uh, we'd take two telephone lines and we took a little transformer between them which we called a phantom coil and by hooking that the, the, onto the two telephone lines with this phantom coil, it had a little pair of terminals on it. You'd hook a third wire telephone line on that and run it to wherever you wanted it to go. And then we had a little machine, <coughs> not much bigger than that, that you hooked on there. You could put a map in there and this little scanner light would travel back and forth across this map and you could transmit a, wi uh, um, a map. Even back then? Or a picture, yeah, yeah. way back there. Uh, over that phantom circuit, and the scanner on the other end would pick it up. It's almost like a fax machine today. That's right. Yeah. But we had it. We had it then. It's amazing. <laughs> and then we had, uh, uh, like I said, we were. Uh, uh, I had so very, very many different kinds of units at my disposal. I had one, one big uh, truck, uh, which you'll find in that envelope there called the Ridge Runner. Now it had two complete telephone boards in it which were similar to the the same boards that you had. We used to have what we call ring down telephone boards in the in the central offices where the girls would pull the plug and right. plug in over there you know to make the circuit. But well, we had two positions in that in that Ridge Runner and that was part of part of my equipment that I had charge of. I also had Jeeps and uh, as I said, a lot of the time I worked alone, just with one or two men. Mm -hmm. I even, uh, believe it or not, I even had a town surrendered to me uh, at the very end of the war. I don't know what, the, I can't tell you the name of the town, I can't substantiate. But at the very end of the war, our 6th Armored was just going to beat hell because the Germans were on the run. So they came up to this little German town, they just went out around it and kept on going. See, they didn't disturb a thing because you, Basically, you might say the war was winding down. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, four of us went into the town 
the next day, and uh, the next, yeah, the, 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 just right after that, and uh, we didn't know where we were going to stay. We didn't know we were going to sleep in the church. There were just the four of us, or whether we should ask somebody to move into their house next door, and uh, uh, so we could get into a bed, which we hadn't been into for a long time. So we finally asked some people to move. And I'll say this one thing: we never looted, we never touched a damn thing, we never destroyed, we never stole. Anyway, we slept in their beds. You asked them to leave so you could use their house. That's right. We never touched a thing. Mm -hmm. So the next morning, here came this little German. And he he always has reminded me of Edith's dad because he was a little dapper German. In fact, he was in World War I at uh, mm -hmm. age 17. Uh, but here came this little German down towards me. And I was a buck sergeant. And he kept coming up to me. He says, come and sit here. Come and sit here. Come and sit here. So I went with him, and I went up to this house there, in the little village, just a little village up there, and uh, they took me into the kitchen. Well, they were surrendering the arms of the village to me, and here in the middle of the kitchen floor was a pile of old, old rusty guns, old bayonet, you know, whatever, nothing, <laughs> nothing harmful there outside of there was a box of dynamite there. Well, I had some young... German soldier come back. While we were in that house over there, they could have blown us to kingdom come because we didn't post any guard. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, so come and see were, here. Come and see here. They were ready to surrender, apparently. You bet. They they were reset, they were surrendering the arms of the village to me. Well, it was probably more than uh, two hours and a half after that. Uh, an intelligence team came in. Of course, then they took over. They talked German and they. Mm. Uh, they took it from there. Well, let's go back to uh, when the war started. What, where were you at, and how old were you when the war started? Okay, uh, when the war started, I was the projectionist. I had charge of all the electrical work and the lighting, and the projection equipment in both the Windsor and the Lido Theater in Hampton. I had been there about two years. Uh, I had a job which I was very happy with. The pay was fairly well for, for those times. And the family that I worked for, the Petersons, were the most kindly, considerate people in the world that you could ever have for employees. In fact, even now, about every three weeks, uh, the daughter and I correspond or talk uh, back and forth from Hampton. Uh, she lives in Hampton, and I just got a letter from her the other day. Did you live in Hampton at that time? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, she she sold tickets in the theater. Okay, but you and, li you uh, lived there too at that time. Oh yeah, she they all they they had a, they had a there was a beautiful beautiful big apartment up over the Windsor Theater there in Hampton. They lived upstairs, and uh, she sold tickets, and her brother acted as manager. But uh, then their dad was still alive. He owned it, but. Uh, is that the same well, spot it's at now? Yes, yeah, just the same theater. And, mm -hmm. and when I worked for them, uh, they just took the end as a member of their family. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were they were just wonderful. So uh, I had a good job. I had nice employees. I had no reason to want to to get out of there. Mm -hmm. But when the when the when the Japanese invaded our Hawaii over there on the D seven. December 7th. Uh, I wasn't infuriated, but I was just plain damn mad. So I decided I was going to do something about it. So I had two assistants in the theater. I had uh, relief operators, in other words. I had one that worked in the other theater, and sometimes I'd exchange with him. But uh, I didn't have to give him a whole lot of notice before I quit because I had these other fellows to take over my job. So I quit my good job. I just bought a new 1942 Chevrolet four-door, which I had traded uh, traded for, and uh, I bought that in Eldora from a fellow by the name of Cecil Way that had the Chevrolet garage on there that I had known for years because prior to that time, uh, all the way through high school, I ran the projectors for the Grand Theater in Eldora. Oh. And uh, then after that, I worked for the power company, uh, which was Central States Electric at that time. So my background with electricity, and, and I was uh, back in Eldora, uh, I was running silent pictures, and I graduated to 
sound on records, which were great big records about that big around, <laughs> that the needle went from the inside to the outside. Mm -hmm. And then we went from sound on film. So I went through all of that transition. And uh, well, anyway, getting back to Hampton, uh, I had no reason that I wanted to leave there, but I was just plain dab mad at the Japs. So uh, I, uh, and from there, right there, from I was 34 years old. So I, I didn't even have to go. I wouldn't have gotten, probably wouldn't, I might not have even gotten drafted. Well, anyway, uh, I was so mad that I decided I wanted to do something about it. So uh, uh, I asked for an enlistment, and uh, uh, and right then is where things started to get to getting strange. Uh, I got on the bus. There was about twelve, fifteen fellows on there. I got on the bus to go to. to, to to Des Moines, to Fort Des Moines, uh, down there, uh, to enlist. And when I got on the bus, this driver handed me a sheet of paper. He says, you're responsible for these fellas. What the hell? I had no authority over them. <laughs> well, anyway, and there wasn't any place, there wasn't any stops between there and, and Des Moines, so there wasn't any way for from to run away from me. <laughs> so anyway, we got to Des Moines, and they took us out to Fort Des Moines. Well, it was two days before they... Uh, uh, I don't know why, but they let us sit around there for two days before they d decided to swear us in. Well, uh, I had one experience there that was, uh, I was I was never around animals all my life. Well, anyway, they came in the, in the barracks down there and they got me and took me out and uh, put me in a riding stable where they had riding horses. Uh, some of the officers down there had them. And uh, I was supposed to clean out one of the one or two of the stalls. He, well, shoot! I was just busy backing off of the corner as far away as I could run because one of them would snort. I would raise off the floor about that high. See, well, the sergeant came in there and he just looked at me and he says, "You're not used to being around horses, are you?" And I said, "No." I said, "I'm scared to death of them." He said, well, "You go back to the barracks." He said, "In the first place," he said, "They they had no business sending you out here because you haven't been sworn in yet." Well, anyway, uh, we were sworn in, and. Uh, the next, uh, well, after we were sworn in, they loaded us into a truck and took us into Des Moines uh, fairly early in the evening and took us to a sleeper, which was on a siding right near the depot there. There's, there's a hotel just about a block north of the depot in Des Moines, still is. I don't know what the name of it is. Hmm. It's down on Walnut, is it? Um, not the same. Well, it don't, it don't make any difference. There's a, there's a hotel. There, there is, I think, still a hotel there, okay. just about a block north of the That's of the, the passenger country. depot there in Des Moines. Uh, may not even be a passenger depot anymore. Anyway, this this car, this railroad car, sat on that siding. So they dumped us off uh, at this car. Well, there again, they gave me a sheet of paper. You're responsible for these men. Well, hell, of course, as soon as it started to get dark, and we were right, you might say downtown, the boys started peeling off and going uptown. There wasn't anything I could do about it. Just, was, I was just thankful they all came back. <laughs> well, then they, uh, sometime during the night, they hooked on to us and hauled us down to Camp Crowder, Missouri, uh, uh, which is at uh, uh, the ocean, it's near Joplin, Missouri. And uh, we got down there, and uh, in the meantime, when I enlisted, I specified I wanted to be in the Signal Corps. And they looked at the paper and they said, well, you're 34, uh, how are your legs? And I said, well, they're pretty good. So they said, okay. So they put me in the Signal Corps. I had a choice because I was enlisted. Why did you want the Signal Corps? Because of my background, and I was interested in communications. Well, anyway, uh, uh, they assigned me to a... Uh, training unit there, you know, uh, barracks where they bring all the new the new soldiers in to train them and everything. Well, uh, there again, I started to look out. Uh, they had a new theater there, a big one that had just been built. It was wooden, but it was big. It seated, Lord, I don't know how many people. And when they looked over they, my, uh, over my records, they said, I see you, you've been a projectionist. And I said, yeah. And he said to me, well, do you know anything about an E7 rear shutter simplex projector? And I said, yeah. 
I said, I worked with him. Not only that, I, I learned to do minor repairs on him. You're just the man we're looking for. <laughs> we don't have a projectionist. <laughs> so uh, they had one, but he was just a kid, and he couldn't keep a picture on the screen to save his life. <laughs> so they took me over to the theater, and that exempt me from all of my ordinary boot camp duties. I had no keep. I had no KP. I had no no work detail. I had nothing. I just ran the machines. <laughs> And uh, the only thing I did, I did have to uh, attend some classes, uh, which I had time to do. Did you have to march and drill, or uh, didn't they do that then? I, I didn't. Uh, I, uh, I had to go on one or two marches, and at, at that time they were just paying twenty-one dollars a month. And the only uniform unit that was issued was the uh, the wool ODs. Okay. Okay. There was no such thing as fatigues. Or no such thing as the suntans as we later on had. We just had the ODs, where they'd march us out through woods and then turn tear gas on us. Well, then you can imagine how that tear gas would creep up that wool and around your neck. It was terrible, and you had to pay for cleaning it yourself out of your twenty-one bucks. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, that went on for a while, and uh, I did get some training. Well, then one day they came and got me, and they took me to a remote corner of the camp where there was a barracks. And there was only about three other fellows there. And I says to them, what in the world, what, what is this all about? Just never mind, you'll find out. Well, what happened was that within a day or two, here came, I would say, about, oh, well, maybe 15 men all in uniform. There was first lieutenants, there were second lieutenants, there was three or four captains, and I don't think there was any sergeants in the group. Well, anyway, they were a cadre from the Indiana Bell Telephone Company in Indiana, and every one of them was a highly trained technician. One of them was an engineer, another one was a line foreman, uh, another one was uh, another phase of telephone work, and et cetera, and they all had a minimum of five to ten years' experience with Bell Telephone. Mm -hmm. They were in uniform for the first time. They'd never been in the Army. They'd never been to boot camp. But they'd worked together in civilian life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I had, I was a corporal by that time, so I had to train my own officers the articles, of, I had to teach them the articles of war, how to salute, how to give commands, and the whole... And they were your superiors. The whole thing, yeah. And I was a corporal. Well, they worked into it beautifully. Uh, and I was with them, uh, you might say, the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the war, uh, unless I was on detached service. But there I was training my own, my own superiors. And... Uh, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me because my my company commander had been a uh, had been an engineer for Bell Telephone, and the things that they taught me you can't believe that were beneficial to me in, in later life. In later life, then uh, someplace along in the interim there, uh, they sent me to a Bell Telephone school on on telephone basics, and uh, so like I said, I learned a lot. And I had men that were willing to teach me, uh, and I got along beautifully with them. I never had any discrepancy at all. Mm -hmm. Well, then, from this cadre, was formed the 93rd Signal Battalion. Okay. Now, the 93rd Signal Battalion was a unit that was to furnish all of the communications, and I mean all of the communications, for the 12th Corps. Now, the 12th Corps was the pride and joy of General Patton. I ran across him several times. Uh, that was his pride and joy, and you might say that was the heart of World War II. Okay, uh, the, the, the battalion was activated, and before we left Germany, it was deactivated. So there is no record. If you look at the Legion magazines, you won't find any news, any anything. You won't find any governmental records 
of the 93rd Signal Battalion because it was a non-existent thing. But uh, I had some men under me, and they, was, uh, they were all corporals, or they were all sergeants with a T under their arm, which made them a technical sar uh, technician sergeant, not technical, but te technician sergeant. Mm -hmm. I was a three-striper at that time. And that griped them, because they had to draw a KP, even though they <laughs> had a rating. But I, I outranked them. Uh -huh. And of course, I caught sergeant of the guard. Well, and we, uh, we went from there. We uh, uh, went out to, uh, we went to uh, the Cumberland University in Tennessee. And there again, instead of being caught in the regular field maneuvers, I was put, be, I, I was put on uh, detached service and to work with the telephone company. Now what year was this? be about, well, it'd be between 1942 and 44, because we left the country in 44 okay. in April. But anyway, uh, I've got, there's pictures there of my repair car that they furnished me, a regular telephone repair car with a ladder on the side of it and the toolboxes on the side of it. So I was patrolling the lines, all the wires that, that had to do with the Army maneuvers down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only the wires on the poles, the hundreds of wires that we laid on the ground for the maneuvers, and even checking through the main frame of the, uh, of the downtown uh, offices. In fact, I got so good at it that I remember Shoemaker up here when he was manager of the uh, telephone company up here after the war. Uh, they were having troubles over at Ackley. Paul Hudson was uh, chief of police at that time, and we were we were installing burglar alarms. Well, they had a they had a couple of lines over there at uh, Ackley that just absolutely could not work, and uh, Shoemaker sent his repairman over there to correct that. And they couldn't find it. So I told him one day, I said, what the hell, I'll find it for you. Ah! I said, okay. He said, okay, I'll take you over. I did. You found it? I went right to it, on the main frame. <laughs> well, they did teach you pretty well then, didn't so they? So I had very, very good training. Like I said, being rubbing elbows with all these telephone men. I, uh, uh, well, anyway, I was on detached service uh, with the with the telephone company down there at, uh, uh, at the Cumberland University. There's pictures to okay. substantiate all that there. <clears throat> and then we went, uh, where did we, we went out to Camp Young, California, out in the desert. We were 25 miles from Indio, okay. and we were put into desert training. Now, we were not allowed fresh milk. We were not allowed fresh fruit. We were strictly on rations because we were being trained uh, to go down uh, to fight or to work against Rommel. Well, in the interim, Rommel was defeated. So <clears throat> they changed our training then, and uh, they put us on a train, on a troop train in San Bernardino, California. In the meantime, down there at, uh, at Camp Young, uh, they put me on detached service again. They gave me a command car and a driver. Army camps strung all around the desert there. The, the, the desert, uh, the California desert, is, is kind of surrounded by low range of mountains. There's Iron Mountain, and then there's another one, uh, I can't remember, it's a, it's a religious name, the Joshua Tree or something like that, mm -hmm. mountain, and the three or four others. Well, there was camps strung around near these camps. So they sent me with this command car, took me off of my regular duties again, sent me around with this command car to these camps giving lectures and showing 16 millimeter movies on the Anopheles mosquito. <laughs> well, the Anopheles mosquito is the malaria carrying mosquito, uh, and this is what we were going to be subjected to if we went south, see. In the jungles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and, and my, my job was to teach, uh, to teach and to lecture to how to protect themselves, be sure to use their netting and all that sort of thing. How, how vital it was that they do that. Well, then they put us on a, on a troop train. When Rama was defeated, they put us on a troop train and, and shipped us to, uh, went all the way across the United States to uh, Camp Shanks, uh, New York. 
And from there, we got on the, uh, the Queen Elizabeth, which was the twin ship to Queen Mary, just a few feet shorter. And uh, we were overseas in about, uh, took us four days to cross the ocean itself. Four days? We were so fast that we would, we would zigzag like this so the submarines couldn't keep track of us. And we would go, there were just literally thousands of ships heading towards Europe at that time. So we would steam right up through the middle of these convoys for extra protection. So we were over there four days and we, uh, we landed at Greenwich, Scotland. Now you'll find that on that big the map. map there. Mm -hmm. And from Greenwich, Scotland, we went, uh, I went all the way from Greenwich, Scotland, clear down to Southampton, which is where we jumped off for the invasion. Okay. And uh, on the way down, there again, they put me on detached service. They, they pulled me off of my regular army duties and uh, uh, assigned me to the general post office, GPO they called it. And the general post office in England uh, owned the telephone systems as well as the general post office. Well, I was assigned to them and I was furnished a little English Austin telephone repair car. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was in, uh, I was in Kitty Minister and I was in Birmingham. When I was in Birmingham, uh, they had me running all over the town installing telephones because that Birmingham was where the initial plans for the invasion were formated. And uh, in fact, I installed a phone on uh, General Patton's office. Really? And uh, so I was on detached service there. In fact, I had enough free time, I bought a bicycle. I got pictures of me riding it there in that, in that envelope. Okay. It's all marked on the back of the envelope. And uh, so then we went on down to Southampton and uh, uh, we were outfitted there. And uh, there is where we were issued our, our carbines and uh, what combat gear we had, which wasn't a whole lot. And uh, so I went over, I crossed the channel, I would say on about the I can't be exact about this, but it's probably in this book I'm going to give you about the fourth or fifth day of the initial invasion because uh, we crossed the channel on a little freighter and then when we got over there, the tide had changed and we were supposed to go in on a raft, a huge big raft, which was big enough to put three or four vehicles on it. Well, they lowered us off of the side and our vehicles onto this damn raft and it got dark and the tide changed. So we had to stay on the raft all night, and here comes the German fighter plane swooping over the hill at uh, Utah Beach it was. I believe it was Utah Beach, it tells on the map there. And they were strafing the hell out of us, and all we could do was crawl under our trucks. But we had to stay on the raft. So we went in the next morning in daylight, and uh, uh, they hadn't had a chance to clean things up, so our raft were just nudging bodies aside as we, as we went to shore. To, to land at the beach. And uh, we went in, and there's more pictures to substantiate that. We went in and uh, we dug slit trenches and uh, put up our pup tents alongside of it. And uh, but we didn't have the pup tents for long after we got to work. But that was our first night after the invasion in France, down in the southern end of France. Well then, the battle maps will show you where we went from there. Well, from there on in, uh, I was on, uh, uh, I was on detached service again. I, I was, uh, I was in advanced parties. Uh, I, like I said, I never fired a shot, but I got shot at plenty. We were told we were setting ducks if you're up on a pole fixing a, uh, a telephone line. You had no chance to shoot back. In fact, you didn't take your rifle up there with you. And, uh, this is about a week after the invasion. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, if you got strafe, you would just dive in the first cover you could. And uh, so, by the strafing and the artillery fire, of course, and the uh, uh, at that time we were having quite a uh, quite a uh, I would say scare maybe of paratro paratroopers dropping in behind us. And, 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 and then filtered it into our lines. 
Well, anyway, uh, like I said, I was never really a part of a set unit that marched from here to there. I had a jeep. I had, I had this uh, ridge runner, and uh, uh, as we went up through the uh, up through France, we uh, liberated some uh, some uh, camps. You know where they kept the poor devils. Uh, what, 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 what concentration sort of, camps? Huh? Concentration camps. Concentration camps. There's pictures of those there. Tell me about that. What uh, these they, were in? They France? were just huh? These were in France or? In this Germany? was in Nancy, France. Okay. It was one of them, and uh, they were horrible things. They were just like big barbed wire pig pens, and that's the way they lived. And uh, uh, so we turned them loose. And I've, I've got a picture of the concentration camps in there, of a couple of them. These were camps where they kept the Jews? Or Beg pardon? Jews or, or prisoners of war? Or who oh, I don't know. They were prisoners of war. I don't know who they had in there. But anyway, I, I had about four pictures that I destroyed that I took later on. We, uh, uh, we came to a town where our fourth armor had been through there. And here was a whole, I mean a big pile of nude bodies. There was men, women, and children that they had machine gunned down. And they had the Germans there with black bands on their arms. And they were making them dig graves or trenches and putting them in as boxes as best they could and give them a halfway decent burial. And uh, that was such a sickening picture that I destroyed them after I got home. And the stench there for miles around was terrible. But uh, where was that located at? I can't tell you. I can't, as I said, some sometimes I didn't know. I didn't even know where I was because then uh, before the uh, uh, they were always sending me out someplace in advance, and sometimes there'd only be three or four of us way out in the field by ourselves. We'd have a little telephone switchboard about that long and about that high that would handle 12 lines, and we'd have field wire running down to an infantry division headquarters or something like that. See, we were out there all by ourselves, and uh, we had to we had to find our own food. Hell, there was no food. <laughs> there was no place we could go to get a meal like that. Anyway, uh, uh, I had this uh, I had this uh, big. Semi. There's pictures of that there too, called the Ridge Runner, uh, with all its equipment in it. So uh, just before the breakthrough on the Battle of the Bulge, they told me to take this this man and a driver and go up to Luxembourg, to the front. And the only maps I had were aerial maps, no no road maps, mm -hmm. just aerial maps. And they told me to stay right behind the fighting lines and try and not get caught in it. So I made it up to, Le uh, to, uh, to Luxembourg all right, and uh, uh, we spent Christmas above about 1944 there and had a pretty nice time because we were at a school there, had a good meal, turkey dinner, and then uh, after that why well, we surged on further north, and that's about the time that uh, uh, our plane just literally came overhead by the thousands, and uh, that's when they put the enemy on the run. And that's when that little village got bypassed that I told you about. That, that, that was, uh, I surrendered to you. Yeah. So that was during the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah, that was during the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, as I said, after that Christmas Day, well, we moved on up further to the front to where we could spread out our communications. But we furnished the communications for the entire 12th Corps. Now, the 93rd Signal Battalion was activated after the war started. It was deactivated before I came home from Germany. I came home with a medical outfit. Uh, I went over. Oh, I'm sure that... Did I hand you a big book? This one? Yeah. In the front of that, I think, is a picture of the... Uh, just a, into a couple of three pages. 
fact, there may be a there may be a page marked there. I don't know. Is here, I'll hand it back to you. Won't you? Is there a little tab there marked? Yeah, here it is. Okay, here's the type of ship I went over on. Okay. That's the Queen Mary. I went over on the twin sister ship, the the uh, Queen Elizabeth. This mm -hmm. is the ship right here in the picture that I came home on. Oh. The Claremont Victory. Okay. And uh, uh, we got caught in a North Atlantic store com uh, storm coming home, and uh, I swear I thought that ship was going to break it too because it was a little, uh, just a little victory ship, and uh, we were bouncing over 30-foot waves, and that thing would just literally leap off the top of them and crash. Well, I got, I got so deathly seasick that uh, if I hadn't been coming home, I swear I'd have jumped overboard. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, it took us 12 days to come home, and but we, got, we got blown a good 100 miles off of our course, and uh, uh, since that time, I hear these social people well, I won't call them social people, but I hear people visiting about the marvelous the time they had on their Caribbean cruise and what the, what not. You could not give me enough money in the entire world to hire me to get on the damn cruise ship. <laughs> when I got sick coming home was when we left Marseille, France. Uh, it was interesting. We were coming out of Marseille, France, and the, the water was smooth. And I was watching the, over the front of the ship, the bow of the ship, I was watching the porpoise swimming mm -hmm. along the front of the ship. See? Well, that was great, but what I didn't know was there was a ground swell there. We reached a point where the Atlantic and the Caribbean were going like this. So the ship was rising and falling considerably, but I wasn't aware of it. And I was looking down at the water to, to watch these porpoise, the first thing that I knew that I was deathly seasick. I puked all the way home for 12 days. Like I said, you wouldn't get me on board another damn ship. <laughs> I like the water, I go fishing or something like that, but you're not going to get me on a cruise ship. <laughs> anyway, if you like, uh, you'll find all the research in the world that you need in this. Because yeah. like I said, this core was the heart of the of World War II. You say it was Patton's favorite. This was Patton's first love. And you saw Patton? Oh yes, several times. In what context? Where did you see him? What was he doing? Well, I just see him around on duty, going from place to place. I didn't. I, I, I never rubbed elbows with him or anything like that. But uh, uh, but this book has information in it that. Uh, I'm sure if you want to do a little research on World War II, you'll find very, very interesting. And it's it's, uh, uh, it's stuff that I couldn't I couldn't possibly remember and tell you. But like I said, I never fired a shot. I got shot at constantly. I remember one night I had this ridge runner, and we had it out in a schoolyard because there was no place else to go. All the officers and all the other men were down in the basement of a schoolhouse. But I was out there in this ridge runner with uh, uh, two telephone operators. I mean, we had the big switchboard. Well, we had wires all over the place to our radio units and, and uh, everything we owned, we had, we had telephone lines to. I probably had a hundred lines coming into that thing. Well, I could monitor those lines, and I actually heard the Germans give the coordinates for their artillery to shoot at us <laughs> in this schoolyard. Now, I actually heard that, and the damn shells came in, and they hit the schoolyard, and the damn rocks were just rained down over that, <laughs> that uh, the truck. truck, like a, like a, uh, like a hailstorm, but like I said, I, Don, I must have had a, a guardian angel sitting on my shoulder because, my God, I was exposed so many, many times. But you made it through. And the fact that I was, uh, well, even going back to where I was in the States when I was out in Camp Young, they took me out of the desert and sent me to San Bernardino to a, uh, uh, headquarter to a uh, supply depot and put me to work uh, 
repairing telephones. Uh, they had telephones like these cradle phones with a dial on them. We probably had a thousand of those among our among our leather field phones that you crank, you know. We had all kinds of equipment. So they sent me to San Bernardino to uh, uh, to work in this supply depot, uh, repair on those telephones. So I had it made there, and the fellows there hated my guts because I was exempt from all, all <laughs> KP, all duty. <laughs> I caught a hell of a lot of sergeant in the guard, and I've got some pictures of that, uh, especially over in Germany, when we'd go into a town that had been blown all to hell, and supposedly, you know, empty. Uh, we were always subjected to a sniper, and of course that could have been a woman or whoever. See. But uh, I would have outposts, maybe four or possibly five places spotted around that town, and I would have to make those posts by myself in a jeep. And you talk about an eerie lonesome feeling to be riding around in a bombed out town with the with the buildings in shambles and all the signs clattery banging in the in the breeze, you're really alone. Were you ever shot at by snipers? No. And like I said, I, I must have had a guardian angel sitting with me. Uh, and uh, the fellows used to actually trade things or something to get on my on my guard shift because somehow or other I always managed to have coffee for them. I would brew it in a in a coffee in a in a big three gallon coffee can or something, and I would always take them a cup of coffee. Like I said, I, I got to be a prize where they. They, they wanted to get on my shift because they knew I would have coffee for them. In fact, there's pictures there where I'm making coffee out in the in the Black Forest there in Germany. Well, you talked about when you were in the schoolyard and uh, the artillery came in. Did you have any other close calls like that? Uh, only only for, from strafing. I dove under cover a good many times from fighter planes. Uh, Especially in Nancy, France, where we thought we were comparatively safe, we we had our uh, our rear echelon there, and uh, boy, they would swoop in there and swoop down, and of course we were just sleeping on the ground there, and uh, boy, I'll tell you, you see those those pressure bullets flashing all around you. Like I said, I I had to guard you an angel. I really did. Sounds like you were certainly in the thick of things. Yeah, but like I said, I wasn't a combat man. I was exposed. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of guardian angels, I've been, I, 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 I've still, I've still got one. Uh, one night about nine years ago, ten years ago, I was coming home from Cedar Falls. My son, had, our son had been here and he had to go to work the next morning. So his wife was going to take him over and then go on to Cedar Rapids, which is where they live. And I said, oh, Lord, don't do that. You stay here and I'll take him back to the... Uh, he was staying in a, with another fellow in a, in a uh, motel in Cedar Falls because he was working on 380. And it was closer, much closer to Cedar Falls at that time than it was to Cedar Rapids. So he was taking the motel there. Well, on the way back, I had a one hell of a electrical storm. I mean, it was so blinding that I had to pull over to the side and stop. Well, I had a funny feeling, but I didn't think anything about it. Well, we discovered about three or four weeks later that I had had a heart attack. Well, I was out, uh, you probably know uh, Gordon Lovers. Yes. Well, he was putting in these thermal paint windows for us in the front here, mm -hmm. and uh, I was helping him because this house has asbestos shingles on it. But turning my table saw blade backwards, you can cut those asbestos shingles pretty neatly without breaking them. Okay. Well, I was cutting them so he could fit them around there, and I was feeling kind of woozy and kind of funny, and uh, I had an appointment coming up with Dr. Pisney, but so I, I called him, and uh, I told him, I said, I feel kind of funny, and I said, uh, I think we better move my appointment up earlier because I don't think I'm going to make it. Well, what I meant was that I didn't think I should wait for another three or four weeks for the appointment. I didn't mean that I was going to die or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, uh, they called first, they said, well, uh, we have a cancellation this afternoon. You come out at 2.30 or whatever it was. And I said, fine. 
So then they called me back and said, well, we've got, we, we just had a cancellation, why don't you come out now? So I went out there now and they put me on the table and Pisney took one look at me and he took my pulse and he went to the telephone and called an ambulance. And my pulse was down to 32 and dropping. Wow. And uh, he said, uh, uh, I didn't know what he was doing. I didn't even know he was going to do it. So uh, he, uh, uh, he called him the names and he says, I'm sending a man down there in an emergency and he says, I want a pacemaker put in immediately. So then they called my wife and told her that uh, I was on my way to Ames already and, and Gordon had to take her out to bring the car home. Well, they, uh, they put in the pacemaker, but I came back close to dying then. Well, then about four years later, <coughs> I started having funny spells. Well, in the meantime, uh, I started ha having funny spells. And uh, I wasn't even aware of them. But the, the kids got scared to death when they hear what they said, what's the matter with him? Uh, he looks like he's going to die. And uh, I wasn't aware of it. And finally, my wife called the McFarland Clinic in Ames, and she was crying. And she told him, she said, you've got to do something for this man. She says, something right or wrong. She says, I can't stand it anymore. So. Uh, we drove down, and we went in the cardiologist's office. Well, in the meantime, they had had me wearing a monitor, three or four different kinds of them, for about two or three months, a couple of months at least, and they didn't show a thing. And uh, uh, so we got down there to uh, the doctor's office, and we were in there, and one of those spells hit me. Right there in the office. Yeah, and he didn't even say anything to my wife. They put me in a wheelchair, and she was out in the waiting room. They wheeled me past her, and they told her, we're taking me over to to uh, intensive care. Oh. Uh, we're putting in another pacemaker. So what happened, they found out later on, was that the pacemaker was up here. There's a cable that runs through your vein down and hooks onto your heart. Well, this cable had shorted, was shorty, like this. And my heart was stopping. Huh. So they took this pacemaker out. The cable is still there. I can feel it right here. Once in a while it hurts. And they put in a new pacemaker over here. Then what they found out after they got to analyzing it. Uh, I'm, am I boring you? No. This is after they got to uh, uh, analyzing it. Uh, of course, I, I'm still taking EKGs. And I still, let's see, I'm due down there just very shortly now. Second of second of uh, March for another checkup, but when they take an EKG, you'll look at this this graft here. Mm -hmm. See all these bumps here. Okay, Maybe. those are heartbeats. Yeah. This is where my heart stops. There's absolutely no heartbeat. Wow! So it skips a beat. No. Now what happens? What happens if they they have a with these pacemakers, you can stop them, you can start them, you can speed up the beat, or you can slow it down by putting a big magnetized thing about the size of my hand, or maybe a little bigger. It looks like a, it looks like a microphone on a CB radio. And holding it over there, and by punching the proper keys on the computer, you can control that control that uh, pacemaker. But what they do is when they when they run an EKG, is that they stop the pacemaker for just about two and a half seconds. When they do, this is what happens. I have, I have no heart, I have no regular heartbeat. Uh, the, the, uh, the fact that we didn't find the heart attack for such a long time after I had it, what it did, it killed all the muscles in my heart. And there isn't enough muscle there to make my heart beat. So these little impulses from the pacemaker make it. But the first one was defective. This first one was defective because it had a defective uh, uh, it had a defective cable. And I read an article in the Des Moines paper the other day where they run across another bunch of those defective Well, cables. it's funny you should say that because I just talked to a lawyer in Eldora the other night and he has a case where his client, a lady, had a pacemaker put in and it's the very same thing. Yeah. A defective uh, electrodes or whatever they yeah. are. So what brand was yours, the bad one? They're both the same make and uh, uh, Made in Minneapolis. 
I can give you the I can give you the exact name of it if you'd like to know. I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if I if I get to talking too much or saying too much or oh, getting uh, getting into something that yeah. you're not interested in, for heaven's sake, tell me so that I can stop because yeah. you're not going to hurt my feelings. No, it's very interesting. Everything is interesting. Uh, in fact, I'll probably have some more questions for you here in a minute. Now I've got a lot more pictures than this, but I picked out the ones I thought might be the most okay. the most interesting. Looks like maybe that other picture was from there then too. Yeah. Looks like the same smokestacks. I think I think this one was from there too. Probably. Probably. This is one of my corporals. And that is my that's me standing here in the park. This uh, this picture speaks for itself. If you notice, uh, it's stamped on the back with the Army examiners. This is a hotel in Germany that was bombed. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's Adernock. It tells the name of the town there on the back of it. What do you? It's Hotel Adernock. You can see Hotel it. Hotel Adernock. Yeah, that's the name of the town. Now, I was in the hospital twice uh, while I was in the service. I was in the uh, field hospital in France for overexposure. Uh, they just kept me for a couple of days. And piled blankets on me and hot water bottles and all that sort of thing. The second time I was operated on in Regensburg, Germany, and I was lucky enough to get it into a Catholic hospital there where the, the sisters were still uh, doing the work, but uh, I had an American doctor. Uh, in fact, he had a, I've been up to see him after the war, I was up to see him, he had a clinic up between St. Paul and Minneapolis. Mm. And this is uh, some of the nurses there that we're at the hospital. They have a lot of male nurses, or well, these are patients and a nurse. Those I are see. patients, yeah. patients and a nurse. Yeah. And that's just a picture of me. That was in Germany? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know what that is, but it sure got the hell knocked out of it. Hmm. Now this building here was a school. Uh, I believe it had been a private school, and it was right across the street from the post office, which had a big open parking lot. Well, <clears throat> uh, we were parked up there temporarily, and a very good friend of mine from Texas uh, was sitting on the tailgate of the truck writing a letter to his wife, and they were going to show some 16 millimeter movies over here. So I told him, I said, well, why don't we go over and watch the movie? No, he says, I, gotta, I want to finish the letter to my wife. Well, I just got away from him. Uh, it was fairly high level, and there was probably 15, 20 steps to get down to the street. Well, I just got over to the end of the strip street, and a, and a damn rocket came in and hit the wall of the post office. Well, it, the shrapnel just took my, the top of my friend's head off, just from here, just like you'd slice it off. Gosh, I've got I've got a notice on the back of that there. Hmm. This is the camp I was in for a while out of Camp Young, California.
company commander, Captain Johnson. Well, he wasn't my company commander. He was a he was the construction company commander. There's the Danube River at Linz, Austria. That's in the forest near Le Mans, France. This is the way they had the troops march uh, when they were out on a road uh, for this reason, that if aircraft come along and strafe them, they could peel off to the ditch on both sides of the road. Being a sergeant, I had charge of the floor. You think that wasn't a pain when some of them come in drunk? <laughs> That's just a scene taken in a hill there in England. I'm passing up a lot of these because they're just. That's in Nancy, part of the buildings in Nancy, France. Is this part of the concentration camp? No, it's just a, just just a city. Building. This probably was a railroad depot. <clears throat> This is the hospital I was in in, uh, in Regensburg, Germany, at the end of the war, right at the end of the war. Mm. There's the remains of a burned out freight train. We ran across several of those. Burned out from bombing? Yeah. Bombing or strafing. That's Luxembourg City. That's a beautiful town. These are French people showing their hospitality as we went down the road. Hmm. This is in or Orleans, France. It's been bombed too, huh? You bet. Well, those are corporals and sergeants. You wouldn't be interested in that. There's a street, just a street in, in uh, Birmingham, England. This is just a just a convoy. What a way to live. I described it on the back of that. <laughs> Filthy place. <laughs> 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 
This is one of the camps here in the state. I don't know which one. Is that you getting a haircut? Yeah, that wasn't me, but. There's another burned out freight train. Oh, you saw that picture of the Adirondack Hospital. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the same Hotel. town. Okay, here's the Ridge Runner. It had all the equipment in that I told you about. That's me no. sitting up on top of it. Okay. It's a pretty big truck. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Now, if you'll notice real close here, you can see a bunch of wires coming down this tree, and one of us is working on a on a terminal there where the where the telephone lines connect together, the field wires I should call it. There's when we went the full length of England from Greenwich, Scotland. I don't know where this was, but I think probably it was the same picture I showed you before. Well, it's the concentration camp. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's another train, I think. Mm -hmm. They didn't leave much of them, did they? No. <clears throat> Here we've got electrical generators sitting back there, but kind of hiding it as much as we can between the buildings. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's another shot of it. The doggone concentration camp. I get the impression you don't like to talk about that too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, now this was interesting. It tells on the back of it. I sat there, I, I was there by myself for three nights. Now we went over there and you might say, we, we, the French, we literally saved their asses. But while I was out here, I practically had to stay awake all night because the sons of bitches were coming up in little boats and trying to steal our stuff. <laughs> Look at the back of it. Marseille. Guard for three days and ship choice. They would steal us boots off of our feet if they could have got them off. <laughs> <off. laughs> this is more troop trains. This is where. Didn't realize the trains had that many doors on each car. Yeah, yeah, it's almost separate com compartments. Really? Yeah. Now this is where practically all the units converged when they were getting ready to come home. This is in Germany? Yeah, Metz, Germany.
Now this was a good day before we pushed on north to we were just beginning to get, like I said, we just, were just beginning to get the Germans on the run, and literally thousands of bombers going over our head. During the bulge. And this was at Luxembourg, and if you notice, we've got our mess kits there. It's Christmas of 44. You lined up ready to eat or something? Or? Yeah, we're, we're, we're getting ready. We're, we're, for we're lining up to eat. Here's another, I don't know which town that is, that may be Edernach again. Yeah, that's what it says back here. Yeah. Huh. I don't know where this was. The Shell Buildings. And this was probably, I don't know if this would be, in t probably a Tennessee. Mm -hmm. A lot of modern homes in the city of Luxembourg is one of them. Hmm. It's like a mansion. Yeah. This is probably the church that I was sitting in front of when the shell hit it. Oh. And the stuff rained down on me because if you look at this one steeple on it, this is taken from the back side. See where it where it hit the side of the steeple? Maybe this one? Yeah. Could be. See the one there, where the, see the notch where a shell has clipped it? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't mm -hmm. be surprised if that's the back end of the same church. There's that or not again. Got lots of those. Hmm. Now the Germans came out with what they called the V2 rocket. Now it was one of those rockets that hit that post office there that I spoke of in Kitty Minister, where my friend got the top of his head cut off. Well, they, these are English. I don't know if you call them scientists or engineers, but this is the remains of one of the rockets and these fellows are examining it. I've written it on the back. Hmm. It's interesting. you see a lot of those go over? Or uh, not too many, no. They uh, they didn't have the luck with them that they thought they were going to have. They they uh, well, they didn't have uh, they didn't have radar. They didn't have uh, uh, the capability of uh, of uh, aiming them. What if they had worked better? I think that would have made a difference. Well, they could knock hell out of things, but you see, they 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 they, 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 did, they, they couldn't. They, they hadn't learned to control where they were going to hit first. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is. That's yeah, just a... Well, Bruce was a corporal. Uh, I don't know who the man is. No, not that. This one. That's that. That's probably he was standing in front of the red runner there. And this one here, I don't have any idea where it was or what that man was doing there. Hmm. No, 
I think I showed you one of these before. This was a N E V I L L E France. It's the railroad men again. Oh, okay. Mm hmm. This is a typical picture. He's fish, fixing our rations. Hmm. How was the food? Well, we ate rations practically all the time. The canned rations were good. Well, I didn't. I didn't never mind any of them. We we had some of these finicky eaters, you know. It just had a fit, but I never minded it. These are just some of the fellows where we were sitting around. I don't know what we were doing there. Now this is Le Mans, France. We were in the forest here. We we traveled in the forest as much as we could and stayed off of the Autobahn. Mm -hmm. Because of the planes. Yeah. Apparently this is just a uh, getting ready to come home or something. We had some pretty buildings in in Luxembourg. Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, here's another one. I never I never got such a chewing out in my life as I did on a lady. I was getting on one of these buses and uh, I had to go up to the second deck. Well, I didn't know any better. The steps are real steep. Of course, when I walked up, I was kicking my heels back. And the lady underneath me, the next one coming up behind me, I guess I was practically kicking her in the face. And boy, you talk about getting an English chewing out. <laughs> oh, did she tell me off. <laughs> At first, I couldn't even figure out what she was mad about. <laughs> So I learned after that to keep my feet close to the... <laughs> Chevelle, France, wherever that is, has been approved. That's another one. I think Luxembourg or Nancy, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. This fellow is just posing. <laughs> is that you? No. Uh, this was Corporal Johnson. If you notice this telephone pole in the back here, it just loaded with all kinds of wires and connections and everything. Uh, our communication lines. <clears throat> okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the barracks we stayed in for a while where, where I had my private room in the end of it. You see, I wasn't a bad looking guy at one time, Don. <laughs> Which one's you? The one on the, the left? Right, on I the think. Right? Let me see. Yeah, I'm I'm this one here. Okay. Like I said, I wasn't a bad looking guy once upon a time. <laughs> Fifty some years ago. That's Campion, California. Like I said, they had us in there 
on dry milk, dried fruit, no, no fresh fruit, no fresh milk. Yeah, right for the desert. Okay, this is the hospital where I had the surgery. Mm-hmm. In Germany. Yeah. At Regensburg. Regensburg, Germany. Now, this fellow here we called Curly, and he was a line foreman. And when he photographed, he was so black, you'd have sworn that he was a black man, but actually he, he was just, it was the pigment in his skin that made him look that way. <laughs> he wasn't black at all. <laughs> it does look dark there. Yeah. This is another one of the corporals. And this is one of the University of Nancy France. Hmm. This was taken in Birmingham, England, and uh, I had another friend, a sergeant. We bought these bicycles for four pounds, and a pound at that time was worth about four dollars. Hmm. So we bought the bicycles for sixteen dollars a piece. We kept them about four days and then resold them. But we had a lot of fun riding them for a couple of days. <laughs> this was just a temporary camp. Camp Young. That's the that's where I was on on a desert assignment and went to all these camps and gave the talk on the Annapolis mosquito. Mm -hmm. Those are just bought in pictures there. Mm -hmm. I think they're probably Nancy, Nancy. France. Mm -hmm. oh. It's a big city. Hmm? It's a big city. What a beautiful, beautiful city. Now, Marlene Dietrich, we saw her on stage in this place. Oh, really? Yeah, over in Germany. God, where was this? I wish I'd have marked that. Look at all the cliffs behind it. Hmm. I think that was probably down towards Springfield, Missouri. Those are big cliffs. Yeah. There I am again riding my bicycle. I always had a great love of children, and uh, in this park in Nancy, France, where we had our rear echelon for a few days before we moved on up, uh, I got one picture here that I bypassed that probably had 10, 12 of them standing around me. <laughs> but I don't know, I've always, I've always had a real soft place in my heart for kids. Is this you holding the, the child? Yes. Like I said, we were highly mobile. We had jeeps by the dozen. Hmm. I can't remember this fellow's name. Now we went on a we went on a field trip one day when I was at Camp Crowder before before we went overseas. This was Roaring River down south of Joplin, Missouri. <laughs> Beautiful place. It's like you're having a good time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this this thing here. We lost a tank on one of these damn bridges. I think I, I thought I had a picture of it someplace. 
down at the uh, Cumberland University, across, or down at Cumberland, uh, yeah, down near the Cumberland University, uh, uh, they run a practice bridge, Bailey Bridge, across the uh, river, and the uh, damn tank went through, and the fellows all drowned in it. Oh, no. That don't happen to be the war. Ponton Bridge. I don't see those floats there. Yeah, okay. I don't know that it's a Bailey or not, but it's, it's, it's okay. tracks laid on, on the Ponton. Okay. Now this is just a just a beautiful church. So. Hmm. Well, I guess that takes me pretty Pretty much through okay. those you might be interested in, Don. Uh, yeah. Very interesting. And like I said, if you like, uh, probably if you want to take that book home with you. I'd like to borrow that if I okay, could. I'll take good care of it. Take, and, uh, don't let it get away from me. I won't. I'll get back to you in a couple of days here. Because it's uh, it's precious. But you'll, 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 be, you'll find out in the very beginning of that uh, what happened? I think I told you about how I happened to go into the army. I was just simply mad at the Jap. I didn't have to go. I was old enough. I could have been. Mm -hmm. uh, I could have been exempt because of my age. Uh, but I often wonder what my life would have been if I hadn't have gone. How do you feel about Japan and Germany today? Is any of that carry over to today? Or? No, I have no hatred for the Germany. Of course, uh, even even before I left Germany, I uh, I got to. Uh, I, of course, I couldn't visit with them because they couldn't talk, but I got to rubbing, uh, I, acquainted with German families over there, and uh, from that I learned a lot. I learned that they were just as damn as afraid of that war as we were. They didn't want any part of it. They were just, well, Hitler. The government threw them into it. Hell, they, they didn't, uh, the average German family didn't hate us. In fact, if they dared, they would help us. And, uh, of course, uh, now, you see, my wife, my wife came over from Germany as an immigrant. Uh, Edith did, when she was 14 months old. And her dad and mother were, came over as immigrants. And then uh, <laughs> Edith had been here for, Oh, I don't know, it's, maybe it's been 10, 12 years ago, I don't know. But all this time, she thought she was an American citizen because of the fact that she, she that her folks were naturalized and, and uh, took the citizenship uh, in this country. And she just figured that she was automatically became an American citizen. Well, here about, oh, it's got to be 10, 12 years ago, uh, just about that long. Uh, her dad wanted to go back to Germany and visit because she still has lots of cousins, and uh, she has some cousins that are working in the German headquarters here in Bonn. And uh, her dad wanted to go back to Germany, and he wanted her to go with him. And he offered to pay her, you know, a ticket and stuff. So she went. Well, when it came to getting her passport, come to find out she was not an American citizen. So. We had to go through a lot of red tape, uh, affidavits, and all this sort of thing, legal stuff that you would understand, to prove that she really should be an American citizen. And uh, uh, the final upshot of it was the the papers all got to Eldora, and uh, they were they were scheduled to leave before a very long time. And the darn cooler down there in Eldora in the courthouse set the damn papers to one side and just left them on his desk and didn't send them on in. Well, uh, her dad had a good friend that was a senator or representative or something in Washington, so he got on the phone. And it didn't take long for those papers to get through. <laughs> well, anyway, we had to go to, uh, we had to go to Cedar Rapids uh, for her to uh, appear before a uh, uh, Judge? An official, a judge, I suppose, an official, uh, to get her papers, her citizenship. And uh, uh, 
she didn't have to go with a group of people. There were other people there waiting to get their citizenship papers. But, uh, he took us in alone. And we got in there and he looked all the papers over and everything was all right. And uh, uh, when he got through, he says, well, everything's in order. He says, I only have one question for you. Do you intend to stay in this country? <laughs> well, God, she'd been over here for, what, 30 years or more. <laughs> but he says, I have one question I have to answer. Do you, do you intend to stay in this country? <laughs> so anyway, then she could get her passport, and then she went to Germany, and she met a lot of her cousins and a lot of her aunt and uncle and some of them over there. What part of Germany were they from? Uh, Edith? Edith? The northern part. Kiel, Kiel, Kiel. Mm, okay. Kiel, up in the northern part. Well, when you were in Germany in the war, did you ever get to Berlin? Or? No, no. Uh, the map will show you there where we went. Uh, I got as far north as, as Nuremberg, mm -hmm. but we zigzagged back and forth. And like I said, I was on detached service, and I even branched out quite a bit farther than that big map will show you. Um, how much time did you spend in Nuremberg? Very much time? Oh, no. Just just a few days. I just wondered if you happened to go to where they had all those Nazi rallies. No, Didn't no. make it there, huh? No, I didn't. And like I said, I wasn't there probably more than two days. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, see, that was pretty much towards the end of the war. And then uh, I backtracked clear down to Regensburg. Uh, and then, of course, I went into the hospital right there for an operation. And uh, you probably knew Gene Foster, mm -hmm. Jughead, they called him. Well, known him for umpteen hundred years. Anyway, just Gene Foster before, down in Eldora? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, see, I uh, I was raised in Eldora, and okay. I went. I graduated from high school down there, and then I worked in the Grand Theater all the way through high school, working running the projectors. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, Gene, after looking at my records and things, he said, "Well, Stan, he said you should be getting a pension of some kind," and he said, "I'm going to put in for it." So he started the paperwork. I had no idea. I never, I never, never occurred to me. He said, "But with your hospitalization and everything," he said, uh, "You should, you should have a pension." So anyway, he started the paperwork, and then about that time, he retired from active service as a, uh, as a representative for the veterans, and a man in Ackley took it over. Yeah, um, Rolfs. I it? think so. Yeah. Well, anyway, Gene turned the papers over to him, and Rolf went ahead and processed them. Well, I got a letter back from the uh, Veterans Administration in, uh, in Des Moines. They're sorry. All of my medical military records were destroyed in a fire in a warehouse in St. Louis. <laughs> no. There was absolutely no, nothing was saved. See? I can remember the fire. I can remember when the fire, and there's a lot of GIs lost their records in that fire. Well, anyway, the only way that I could go ahead and try to get a pension, there would be the substantiated by affidavits from somebody that knew me in the hospital and the only thing, the only proof I had were these pictures that I have here. But uh, uh, I didn't figure it was worth it, it was going to take so much paperwork, I just said, forget it. But Gene, Gene was just sure that I shouldn't have a pension out of it. But what year did you graduate from Eldora High School? About 1926. So I talked to Gene, tried to get him to do an interview, because I know he was at the Battle of the Bulge, but yeah. uh, he didn't care to. Well, let's see, I went into the Army, uh, as I said, uh, uh, I enlisted because I wanted to, for patriotic reasons, let's put it that way. Okay, uh, I was sworn in into the Army down at Fort, Camp, at Fort Dodge, Camp Dodge, on February 12th, 1942, and I got home. I was discharged from the Army on about April the 9th, 1945, and I was home uh, just in time for Thanksgiving in November of 45, mm -hmm. and uh, I was 18 months overseas. 
But uh, I was over there a little longer than necessary because of the fact of the work that I was in. Uh, we had pretty much destroyed the communications in Regensburg locally, so the poor people couldn't talk to each other. Well, I was assigned to work in the central office in the Regensburg Telephone Company uh, with three or four of the other fellows from the, that had been with the Indiana Bell Telephone Company that knew a hell of a lot more about it than I did. And we were to help get their, uh, get their telephone system back in order, which we did. Boy, were those people happy when they could talk to each other again. <laughs> But uh, uh, we had quite a time poring over maps and blueprints between the German engineers in the office and, and our engineers. <laughs> and uh, I was just kind of the uh, gopher man. In other words, I was running the errands and I wasn't really doing a lot of the technical work, except for where there were some connections to make or something like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, we did get their telephone system to work again locally. The long distance lines had been blown out. There was no way that we could do anything about that. But we did get the local, local force to work. You should have heard the joy in those people when they could call <laughs> each other up. Um, where were you at on uh, VE Day? Do you remember anything about that uh, when you heard the war was over in Europe? I was in Regensburg, Germany. Um, when I went back to Regensburg, it was right at you might say VED, VED. Uh, I've got, I've got some pictures of that someplace. Anyway, uh, instead of uh, after I got out of the hospital, instead of going and staying in the barracks or something, I still had my Ridge Runner, so I I used that for my campgrounds and I slept in it. <laughs> So how long were you there? So you got back in like well, Thanksgiving? I got, I, got, I got home in uh, in November of uh, of uh, 45 and I was discharged on the uh, in April okay. of 45 I believe. Wait a minute, I think I've got a note on that maybe here. Uh, let's see. I shipped out to Europe on April the 9th, 1944, and I was inducted in February 12, 1942. I was home, I mean home here in Iowa Falls by November 1945. I had 18 months of overseas duty. But I was held up in Regensburg a little bit, uh, like I said, to help put the telephone communication back in order over there. So I didn't get to come home for probably two weeks after the others did. Was there a lot of celebrating on VE Day? No. How about no. VJ Day? Not where I was. I was too busy working. <laughs> okay. Well, you have anything else you want to add before we finish up? Uh, no, I can't. Uh, I can't think of anything, uh, Don. I, uh, you got a lot of good uh, recollections there. I really found them very interesting. Uh, well, I hope I haven't bored you. Like I said, I, I went in of my own free will. I probably, I've often wondered what would have happened to me if I had stayed out. Now, the fellow that, I didn't have any trouble leaving the theater in uh, uh, Hampton uh, job-wise because we had two, two assistant projectors. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one of them, ran the other projectors. There were two theaters in Hampton at that time, the Lido and the, and the Windsor both. So he just moved into the Windsor and one of the assistants took over the Lido. So I didn't leave any gap there that had to be filled right away. And of course they trained another man. How about when you got out? Did they, you didn't have a job there anymore then, right? Uh, yeah, I went back to Hampton. I went, to Hamp I went back to Hampton for, uh, oh, let's see a year or two. Then I came down here and I bought the electrical business from Charlie Barr. We had the electrical store up there. Um, well, the Quality Royal was in that okay. in the corner building there on the corner of Stevens and Washington mm -hmm. in the basement. Okay. Uh, what's in there now? A, a antique shop or something? 
There was a sports shop there. Yeah. Anyway, I was in the basement there. Down, I would be in the basement underneath underneath KIMG, the same building. Where Price's sports shop was for a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was in the mm -hmm. basement there, and I was there about twelve years. Okay. And uh, uh, what I did, I was uh, I was wearing houses. I had as many as twenty three houses. I was wearing at one time, and uh, I was doing a lot of work for. Uh, Dewey Gilbert Sr., Dewey Gilbert, Dewey Gilbert Jr., mm -hmm. he was building houses over on School Street. This is when they were building on School Street. And uh, uh, Dewey had had an electrician uh, hired, and he literally made a mess out of things. Lordy had cables running and to lights and no, no switches, <laughs> no switch lines. And, and uh, uh, Dewey came to me and he says, Dad, he says, do you suppose you could possibly we weren't straightening out some of that mess for me. And I said, well, I'll try. And uh, I was still in partnership with this uh, Charlie. I finally bought him out after a year or so, because he was, he was elderly. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, uh, I used the no-meter to check my, to, to trace my circuits with, if you're familiar with the no-meter. Not really. Well, I learned to use one in the Army. We called it Wheatstone Bridges. And one of the, one of the, Engineers, my company captain, taught me how to use one. Okay. With that, you could hook it onto a telephone line, mm -hmm. and if you knew the resistance of the wire that you were testing, like the telephone, which we knew we did know of our field work, time, if you knew the resistance of the wire, if that wire was shorted out there, say a couple of miles, or if it was grounded so that there was some bare wire that was leaking into the ground, uh, you could read the resistance of what you call a loop reading. You could read the resistance so many ohms out and back. You well, you knew that if it was a five-mile line, it had to have, say, 2,000 ohms resistance. But if it only had 1,500 ohms resistance, you could tell within just a short distance of where that ground, where that short was. Mm -hmm. Of course, if the line was open, then you couldn't make a loop reading. See? Well, I, uh, uh, that's one of the things I learned in the Army. Well, when I got home, I've still got my original ohm meter that I used when I got home. I've got three or four of them now. But uh, you could do all kinds of testing with those. So uh, when I went in partnership with this little electrician, uh, he uh, he didn't have much faith in that ohm meter. He, yeah, he didn't <laughs> think much of that. But you know, it wasn't more than we hadn't been out more than about on two or three jobs where we were checking out these houses on School Street. When I was Stan, you be sure to bring that little box with you. <laughs> <laughs> he became a I believer. Made, right? I made a believer out of him in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think it was about eight nine months, and then I then I bought him out. And he retired. Then he stayed and worked for me, and uh, repaired and uh, repaired appliances. And that was still back in the day. When the farms had the the wooden boxes on the wall with the handle, hmm. with the ringer on the side of it, so we were we were getting parts for those out of Chicago and repairing those along with other things. Okay. And of course, back in those days, Don, if you had a General Mills iron like like your wife uses to iron clothes with, and some of those appliances, you could order the parts for them and put them in. Try it today. <laughs> Forget it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I took a telephone apart yesterday. We had one telephone in our uh, in our bedroom there. They got the sizzling and cracking. So uh, uh, I bought a new one. And I took the old one down in the basement. And I thought, well, I want to make sure that it's bad. So I hooked it up to London. My daughter was talking to me last night. And sure enough, it was sizzling and pop. So I took the cords off. I took that thing apart. And it's all a printed circuit. Mm -hmm. Just a thousand little dots of looks like solder and stuff like Couldn't that. Fix it if you wanted to. to. You can't do a damn thing with it. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just chucked it. With, I thought there might be a switch or something in there. <laughs> so I. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, my. Uh, I, I meant to warn you when you came. That beautiful, and it is beautiful. That beautiful locomotive sitting over there back of you. Yeah. Okay, that is a telephone. Okay. And when somebody rings in here, calls me on the telephone, that thing starts to whistle. And I mean well, That whistling whistle. we heard was, a was the ringing? Huh? I heard the train whistle a couple times. Is well, that, that was the clock. 
That's oh, my okay. clock in the kitchen. Okay. But oh, that thing, you would have heard it would have raised you right out of the chair. I forgot to warn you. <laughs> it really woo woos. Okay. And then it, uh, then it uh, goes chug, 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 and then it starts to ring like a bell. It's a very authentic sound. I wish I had somebody I could call and have them make it ring. Uh, it really I see a lot of train things here. What is that? Just a hobby? Uh, you got a minute for me to come and show you? Sure, I'd like to see it. Okay.